Well, let's do get started then. Um, I want to welcome everybody and um, start with just some brief introductions. Um, I'm so pleased to have um, our friends here join us and these distinguished folks have their lengthy bios in our bio packet. So I encourage everyone to, to look at the bios there, but just by way of brief introductions, um, Corwin, or Corky Claremont, is a proud member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. And he's an artist, a teacher, and is currently serving on the Montana Arts Council. Corky is an accomplished contemporary artist in a wide range of media, and his work often explores situations or issues that affect tribal people, such as sovereignty, colonization, and giving cultural and historical perspective. Judy Dow is a French-Canadian and a Beniki descent and is executive director of Gidakina, a multi-generational endeavor to strengthen and revitalize the cultural knowledge and identity of Native American women and their families from across New England. And Teresa Gouge um, is Muskoki Creek and Seminole, is a cultural ambassador at the First Americans Museum in Oklahoma City, um, where she facilitates interpretive programs, tours, and cultural classes, and serves as a tour lead among docents for tribal dignitaries. I am so very pleased that you're with us and honored that you joined us for this conversation. Thank and before we get going, um, I want to invite the audience members to feel free to share any questions that you have in the chat as we go, so that at the end we'll have about 10 minutes for an audience Q&A, and we'll refer back to the chat so we can have a running start with your questions. Okay, so um, we had a, a prep meeting last week to get ourselves organized and, excuse me, what came up was um, some conversation about how in your communities you create opportunities to connect and build relationships between generations. We talked a little bit about how certain celebrations, things like powwows, are great opportunities for younger generations and older generations to spend time together and learn from each other. And important cultural information is shared in arts and games and contests and ceremonies. And I wonder if you each could share a few recent examples of how intergenerational relationships are built in and supported in, in your communities. Chime in whoever would like to start. I guess I can go first if nobody wants to. Um, we have communities all over New England um, and uh, there are a lot of things we do. Um, one of them is to, to rent a van, put some elders and some kids in it and to drive to the traditional spots where um, <clears throat> our stories come from. And so we often take those landmarks and connect them with our traditional story, our creation stories around landmarks. And elders will explain the language, connect, it, connect the language with them. Um, we are also doing um, a Passamaquoddy uh, language class in Portland. And um, the children that come have to come with a grandmother or a grandfather. So they bring them and they learn the language together. Um, we have gardening class, gardening programs all over New England. We have four seed saving gardens in Vermont where we see, save heirloom seeds. And then they go out to gardens in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and all over Maine. And um, the women in their groups um, work with the children to to teach them the language that goes with the activities of, of planting and harvesting and growing. And, and um, so we have a lot of things. Um, we have no separate, we have a building, we have no separate senior citizen home and youth center. It's one building that is used for seniors and youth together. Um, so those are some of the things we do. I can go next. Um, here at the museum, we teach um, 
a lot about different cultures. We teach uh, our students who come in uh, that here in Oklahoma, we have 39 tribes, which means we have 39 different languages and cultures and stuff like that. But we try to bring our community together with events. Just like two weeks ago, I was in charge of a TP raising competition and we taught our youth and our elders who never learned how to put up a teepee uh, about different ways that other tribes put it up, put up a teepee, either be a tripod or four poles together. We brought in uh, elders and uh, we brought in young people to come and how to harvest the poles and how to go about making that teepee in itself. So that's what we've been doing um, uh, just this past month because we know every month uh, we, as Native people, we believe in teachings of different seasons. We have four seasons in a year, so uh, it's my, my duty to see what we can do during this season. And so what I chose was to bring in, uh, to do a TP raisin competition and education. It was well attended. Uh, women was the most uh, high point of the, our, event, our event. We had two youth groups and my Biggest challenge was they can put up a TV without using a uh, a ladder. So to see all this community, uh, four person per team, to see the youth work together to lift each other up to put these pegs in at the top, it was just like a great collaboration. So that was a learning tool for young people, and we had their elders as their coach. And so our women competition, we had eight eight uh, teams, and it was. It was a wonderful sight for me learning that back in the day, it was a women's duty to put up a teepee, but to see them put it up in a speed time, it was awesome to see. We had elders, I brought elders to in to judge the teepees. And before then I uh, had classes and we had class here because we had people within our own community that never seen, uh, how to put one up so we had that education so it was fun it brought in multiple tribes together so that was a great community event for us that sounds great yeah. <laughs> and we've had uh, this last uh, year i think some really uh, um, big events for our tribe uh, we uh had a water compact agreement that went through that uh, was was huge and it uh, determined uh, uh, the, the nature of the waters you know in our area but also uh, off the reservation lands because through our treaty you know we uh, uh, had the rights to uh, monitor the waters you know and secure them for our rights to hunt and fish and gather our, our food. So, so through this water compact, we secured uh, some important agreements and also some important funding uh, for our tribe. And along with that agreement, there was also, uh, they worked in uh, the National Bison Range, which was controlled by the federal government. And that was turned back over to the tribe. So we acquired our bison range which is a big chunk of our reservation that was just carved out and so our tribe now uh, is able to uh, take over the management totally of that uh, uh, park and so that was a huge event and we had a great celebration this uh, this last uh, late spring summer uh, commemorating that and part of that celebration of course was uh, was a little powwow and speakers and uh, and just uh, uh, remembering, you know, our our, uh, our animals and and our ancestors and this land, um, you know, should never have been taken to begin with. Uh, so we got that back, and that was uh, monumental for us. Um, and then just lately, a few weeks ago, we had a, another celebration in Missoula. We, uh, they uh, named a bridge, an important bridge that crosses the Clark Fork River. Uh, they named it after one of our, our tribal uh, 
uh, members. Uh, and this is a, kind of a brochure. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, mm, yeah. But it's, uh, of course, it's backwards, maybe. I don't know. No, it's uh, good. We can but see. It's, uh, his name is Bear Tracks, and he was an advisor to Chief Charlotte. And uh, when we s signed the, the uh, 1855 Treaty of Hellgate, uh, we were supposed to have gotten uh, land in the Bitterroot, which is our traditional homeland. And uh, well, it didn't, it didn't happen. And they forced uh, our tribal people off the Bitterroot uh, lands and call it the Trail of Tears, our Trail of Tears. And, uh, and it went through Missoula, which is part of our, our homelands. You know, we never uh, sold that land. We didn't give it up. Again, it was uh, taken, but we still considered our, our lands. So the naming the bridge after one of our tribal leaders who uh, was an important advisor to the chief, Charlo at the time, was really a, a big deal. So we all gathered that day uh, and celebrated and speeches were given. And there were, the, the discussion there was not, uh, it was to, uh, come together everybody not just our tribal people but the people of the missoula community uh to celebrate and acknowledge you know that our, our people and and uh, look for a better future you know for everybody and of course after that we had a great powwow and and celebration and you know right at the site so there's a couple of uh events and and uh, also this last year, we had the uh, 20 year anniversary of our Nkusum Salish language school. And there was a celebration held there commemorating that. And, and the language, the Nkusum language immersion school originally started with just uh, uh, a handful of uh, young people, this kindergarten, you know, uh, elementary kids uh, age. And we started with, I think there was just six or eight students at the time and, and almost that many, you know, language uh, instructors and helpers. And it's grown now to, uh, uh, I think they graduated, uh, I think 19 students and it's K through eight now. And uh, it's made a really big impact, you know, in the preservation of our Salish language. And we try to we have the uh, Salish Kootenai College, which is also playing an important role, you know, in language and, and preservation of our, our culture. And, and we owe a great debt to our culture committees. We have a Salish Culture Committee, a Kootenai Culture Committee, and uh, their job is to preserve the culture and language. And they work with what we call our Elders Committee, who advises and helps out. So there's a lot of different things that uh, in place, you know, to to assist us in preservation of our culture and, and uh, who we are as Salish Kootenai people. We <clears throat> talked a little too about language and culture when we met and, and how quirky as you're saying, it's essential that preserving language is also preserving culture. Um, and I wonder, broadly speaking for everyone, um, how, what other things are happening in your communities to preserve language that your um, older adults are, are connecting with younger people to help preserve language or vice versa? I'll go ahead and uh, make a comment. Um, this is past month, they had a uh, NICA, National Indian um, Education Conference, NIEA conference here in Oklahoma City. Um, I was able to attend the language portion and I loved, loved what the speaker had said is that we as native people do not need to give 
ownership of our language to the universities. It's just that we need to share our, our language within our own communities, within our own homes, the best that we can. And I myself tell my grandkids, if you just say one word a day, you're holding on to culture, you're holding on to the language. So a no disrespect to universities, but those should not be our gateway or entry to learn about language. Uh, it should, we should be taught in our homes. Uh, you know, I know there's online programs. So even though the schools are trying to teach the language, I don't think uh, we need to remind ourselves they're not, they don't take ownership of language. Let's try to pull it back and be within our community. And so I myself, uh, I come from the ceremonial walk. So I belong to a, um, a stomp ground and you hear a lot of language they're used. A lot of, we lost a lot of uh, elders through the pandemic. So sadly is that, you know, we didn't get to see them or hear what they had for the generation that has yet to be born. So we always be mindful of those young people. You got to learn these language and our ways because there's children yet to be born that we need to continue. So the work of our ancestors is not done. So we still have to continue whatever that may be. You know, in our language today, it's still a learning process because we have to develop new words. Because when I was growing up, we didn't have words for cell phones, for internet. So our tribes are having to come up with creative ways to incorporate new words into our, our language. You know, it's just, um, it's just unreal with all the, how fast uh, the world is evolving. So new words are, are yet to be learned and shared. So that's all. Judy, do you have any thoughts to chime in with? Um, yeah, I kind of can relate to everything <laughs> that you just said. Um, but um, the the woman, Sandra, who leads our um, Passamaquoddy languages class, she does everything with the drum. So she's been working to translate um, songs that give directionality and, and um, dire just directions like the hokey pokey put your right hand in, shake it all about, into Passamaquoddy. And so to the drum, she teaches the kids and the grandparents activities like that. And she brings the drum to the garden. And so they greet the garden with the drum. They, they do all the processing of the garden, the planting, whatever it might be, with the drum. And so all of her her program, all of her classes are via the drum. And it's kind of, it kind of, uh, what Teresa said, it kind of brings you into that sacred place when you all gather like that and, and, um, and makes you, the kids interested in wanting to learn it. Something, Teresa, that you just mentioned now about new ideas and new words and new concepts coming into the language also came up in our on our um, prep conversation last week, which and I was very interested to learn. It was really a kind of eye opening for me about how the the experience of folks in the LGBTQ community and the question of pronouns in the English language is is an important one. Um, but you had mentioned, if I'm remembering right and saying it right, that there may or may not even be pronouns in your ancestral language as an indigenous person. And, and so for, for elders who may have questions about this, but also it may be a very different cultural experience, the question of um, how to, I don't know how to say it, like sort of include and properly address and greet LGBTQ folks in your community. Can you share more about that? Because it's a really interesting conversation that we had. Yes, uh, part of our conversation was uh, our language uh, within our own community across the board. Uh, in our native communities, again, we're having to develop new words for new concepts and new, new everything because like I said, we didn't have internet when I was growing up. So we had to develop words for internet, cell phones and all those other electronics technology 
uh, even computers, we never had it. We had to say uh, phone that you talk with your hands that for our computer. That's how we had to describe it. And so I was sharing with Susan that um, in our own community just really recently, uh, we know the LGBTQ community um, has grown and, and people are starting to accept it more and more and you know, it, which is great. And, but we don't have words to get our pronouns as they, she, them, non-binary. That, that was never a part of our language. So we had to somehow put that into our language because you know, people are afraid that, is that in my community? And yes, it is, but it's now you know, becoming more acceptance. And so now we're having to learn new words to describe those kind of uh, concepts and those and those uh, pronouns that we use. And I remember my my dad, he's passed on now, uh, but we had a young gentleman that came over to visit, and he just said, "Grandpa Felix, um, I don't know if you know this." And he was trying to say the word gay, but in a sensitive way to my father, because he was elderly, he said, um, how do you accept, or how does the ceremonial ground accept those who are gay? My dad paused for a while and he sat there and my dad said, we're gonna talk about this just this one time and we're not gonna talk about it again. So he, he agreed to that and he said, we have a, a special place in our heart for those who are, who believe that way. He never just condoned or anything. He just kind of like, it was more a private conversation than to be more open to what it is. Cause he would say, that's private. That's for that family. And, you know, we just don't bring it out in private but it's different today. It's out there in the open. So I don't know what my dad would say if he was here today but uh, he would tell, he told that young man the name of it in our language is Inethkaba. It means in the middle, and they too have a place in our world. And I was sitting and I was listening and I was hoping to hear more, but he says, and that's where I'll end it. So, um, but I have private, private talks with my dad and he just, he would share when he got ready. So we don't, we don't push our elders to say, what else, what else, because it's their time when they want to talk about it and express their feelings and their thoughts about it. And those are the best times ever. You always feel like when they say something, you say, shoot, I wish I had a recorder. I wish I had my cell phone to record this moment in time because it'll never be the same to hear how they express their part and their feelings. Because not one time my dad said, I disapprove. He just says, we won't talk about it again. So again, those kind of words, um, are still yet to be developed in our languages. You know, how do you go to a tribe and says, what's your word for non-binary? You know, that everybody's still developing those kind of words. So that's what we shared. I appreciate that's a personal story and it was a it was a very interesting, you know, conversation that we had. So thanks for bringing that forward. And we all have a lot of learning to do. And that was also part of our conversation about how between older adults and younger people that the intergenerational connection is so important because that's how we keep vital. That's how we keep our culture vital and, and the new things to learn and the and the concepts that need to be with us for our own well-being and survival, those all have to mix together. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's complicated. Uh, yes. For a Salish uh, tribal people, you know, we're considered the furthest interior Salish tribe. But our Salish speakers, speaking tribes go all the way to the coast. You know, there's, uh, I don't recall offhand how many Salish speaking uh, tribes or groups there are, but there's uh, quite a few. And, and I know uh, periodically uh, they do uh, gather the speakers and uh, go talk about these kinds of things. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's complicated and, you know, we certainly, uh, uh, locally, uh, try to deal with, with the, uh, words, you know, coming up with uh, words. proper words. And a lot of times they consult other tribal communities that speak Salish to ask how they're doing it. And then they gather uh, a few times a year of Salish speakers and go over a lot of these kinds of things. But 
but it is, uh, uh, you know, and it's very important because you have to have a language that's uh, uh, relevant. And uh, because if, if you don't continue to add the words as they, or as they come in for definitions of things with our own words, then we're no longer a live language. <laughs> we want to be a, a live uh, language that's relevant. And I, I think the uh, this is a, also a part where young people, you know, that uh, uh, might uh, bring in uh, new words, you know, or ask about new words so that they can feel more relevant or a part of that uh, journey too, because it's their future, you know. Yeah, and it's just so, also add to that, it's just like uh, new words like the pandemic, the COVID. You know, we didn't have words like that as we were growing up. There was no word of COVID or this type of virus or the new viruses that's coming down the pipe. So again, uh, it's an ongoing, I guess, challenge. And it's, you know, we'll be here hopefully another 20 years and there'll be new words that have to be developed. Yeah, big job. You know, and a lot of the tribes have their um, dictionaries, which right. are important. We've uh, uh, have a dictionary, you know, for Salish and Kootenai languages, and, and they've been updated every so often. Um, but it's really been quite beneficial, you know, and shared with all of our Salish speaking tribes. Okay. Um, for us, um, normally, um, we don't have, um, we have, we primarily don't have um, genders assigned to words. However, there are some specific words, like if I said nidoba, which would be friend, nidobasqua, which would be girlfriend. So it would be assigned to some specific words that you needed girl or man or boy attached to. Um, but the interesting thing for me in, in, in the language is how when the settlers first came to the Northeast, there was this interchange of words. So for instance, canoe is one of our words. Toboggan is one of our words. And it was taken, as is Canada, it was taken over by the people who lived here, right? As one of their words, but it really was one of ours. And as time went on, um, we adopted, like everybody has said, many new words. So for instance, we had no word for time. When everything was ready and everything was together, it was time. And so along comes the clock with the wire springs inside. And we translated that to the thing that goes around and does nothing. And we promptly took the springs out and used them for our gauges and our basket making. Um, so the language goes both ways. And um, the Passamaquoddy have a portal um, online, an online portal, and it's constantly changing, like everybody said. We have some concrete physical dictionaries, but they too get changed online for the Abeniki language. Um, and um, I think like Corky said, um, if it doesn't change, it's a dead language and we don't want that. We don't want um, a dead language. Um, and as far as um, a back to the pronouns a bit, everybody pretty much is they. Um, so we don't have he or she, it's they. And two-spirited people are included in that. Um, there's not... They're not, traditionally have not been signaled out, but rather acknowledged and part of life. Thank you for that. Again, just really interesting um, learning for me. Um, Judy, I think back also to something that we talked about in our conversation last week about um, it, the, the responsibility of the elders and the responsibilities of young people. And I wonder if you could restate that because it's, it was such a beautiful thought. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge that has to be shared and has to be saved that elders 
have, um, but they're not just going to go out and broadcast it and share it. It's the responsibility of the youth to ask. So that's why we do so many opportunities together. We throw them in vans together and take off because the youth, we provide opportunities for the youth to ask the elders. Because in society today, people divide them with senior citizens here and youth centers here. And so we find that we have to provide opportunities for the youth to ask the elders the questions they should have if they're because what I tell them is you never want to say, I should have. I should have asked grandpa this. I should have asked auntie this. Um, do it now. And so we provide opportunities for them to do it now. And the other thing I think we talked about was the difference between an elder and an older. Mm -hmm. um, to us, an elder is... Um, someone who picks up their community and moves them forward. An older is someone that just gets old. <laughs> Let that sink in. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> my goal is like to get some of these elder olders to become elders. That's a really lovely segue to the next question that we had talked about, which is, Noting that all three of you are artists or makers, educators, curators in some ways. And to your point, Judy, about elders as folks who bring your community forward, can you share about how your own work in arts and culture might contribute to your community's cultural traditions and future generations? And I absolutely invite, you know, we can make space and time to share some images, um, but just really curious about what your cultural or artistic practices are right now that are bringing inspiration to you, but that also are contributions to your community as well. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm an educator. And so it's important for me to um, teach traditional stories and for people to understand you can take this 14,000 year old story of Guscabe and the Moose and totally understand why this event 14,000 year years ago was documented because it's so relevant today and um, so I try to gather elders and and youth together um, and we make baskets, we make maps, we create all kinds of things to document the stories in different ways than just an oral story. And then we teach the kids how to use it as a mnemonic device to retell the story. Um, and that's critical. We do that all the time when we're, when we're loading them in the van and driving all around. Um, you know, even if it's just a box of crayons and a pencil, the elders are going to tell them everything. They're going to tell them how they survived the late 1800s and early 1900s and during Prohibition and, and um, all of those things that helped them to survive those changes and how adaptation and survival is connected to um, environmental eco economic and um, social and political changes. All of those changes they've adapted to and survived. And it's critical in my mind to teach youth that because um, there, some of these things are going around again. You know, that saying you live long enough, you get to see it happen again. And so when you live long enough and you get to see it happen again, you want the youth to be prepared. And so a lot of my work has revolved around that, helping the youth be prepared um, for coming attractions that the elders have already experienced. I want to note how moved I have been in seeing your work um, somewhat lately, the eugenics and anti-eugenics um, textiles that you've made and how um, important not only I would say for 
your community, but the whole wide world, um, an expression and art like that is for the reasons that you're saying, um, we have to remember. Exactly. Can't forget. Exactly. Um, I have two tapestries on eugenics traveling the world um, right now <clears throat> in conjunction with the 100th anniversary of the second and the third international eugenics um, conferences that were held in 1921 and 22 and 23. And so it's traveling around and it first started at the University of London next to Charles Darwin and Francis Galton's work. And um, Francis Galton was the first person who co coined the word eugenics. And so my work was a direct contradiction to their work. And I was like a little nervous about that, but it was well received. And then it went over to Warsaw in Romania and it's been all around Ukraine right now. And people have been making that connection with what's going on over there. Um, so it's been really important that um, the anti-eugenic story get out there because we're living it again today. Maybe I'll ask Teresa to speak next because I think in your role at the First Americans Museum, you know, there's an, a, a wealth and abundance of art happening there. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Here at the museum, um, as a cultural ambassador, it's my duty, and I'm proud to do it, is to tell the untold stories, you know, to tell the to tell the truth, to tell the real story in there, because we know, as us here living in Oklahoma, we taught we're taught, taught by books. And in those books that is taught to us are incorrect. You know, it's so we're here to try to share the truth about the stories and don't be hiding the truth. Let's share the truth. Like here in our first museum, what's not in our history books is that how many miles the government forced the natives to walk on a trail of tears. You don't see that in the textbooks, but we're here to tell the truth and say that they forced us to walk 10 miles um, a day in that trail of tears, regard, no matter regarding the, the weather. Who those couldn't make it, they were left to perish. A lot of the people don't like the truth, but it's here at the First American Museum where you will get the truth uh, told. The truth could be oral stories. It could be about regalia. We try to share our kids. Look at the regalia people wear. That's a story in itself. And so we have a few here that we share those stories with. And about <clears throat> the history books tells us there were buffalo. We, have, we don't have buffaloes in Oklahoma. There were bisons. But who knew that? We're having to change our, our stories with our youth and said that, okay, let's not say buffalo anymore, let's say bison. But they read that in those history books. So it's our job to correct that. And we have a school here in Oklahoma, Davis, Oklahoma. They have Native American history class at their school. That's the first yet here in Oklahoma. And we're here being Indian territory and we're just now teaching that in our, in our school system. So we're just years and years behind the truth. So here, in, um, we're here to share the, the stories and we learn other stories because I would say most everybody that leaves here, when they see us, they will share their story about the boarding school, about languages, about just the recent court cases that come through here. We hear some story and it's it's a blessing to me because these people want to share their stories with us. I mean, it's a world of still ongoing documentation that we have. So, I mean, it's unbelievable for people to come and didn't know those things. You know, back to our languages, I think across the board, not a native language I know have the word for goodbye because it's never a goodbye is that we'll see you again. So we, we share that with our youth and especially with our kids that goes to boarding school, they come in there and they say, why do we still learn about this? It was way back then. And you have to remind them it's still going on today. We have challenges every single day. So, I mean, it's a great place. And I love sharing, telling the truth and hearing their truth come back, especially with the boarding schools era. I really appreciate that so much, Teresa, everything you're saying, because I oh. think we lose sight sometimes of we meaning in in 
in my community, in my culture, that where the arts are valuable and important, but they represent something yep. very different than what you're describing. You know, the the truth that that comes through in the ways, many different ways that a culture can express in the regalia, in stories, in lots of things. That's a very different encounter and and relationship with creativity, with um, connection, with with making than in my experience where it's wonderful to dance and it's wonderful to paint, but it, but it, but the need to tell a truth is not the same as it is that you're describing. And I think that it's really important to hear what you're saying and, and recognize that making sure that when we talk about arts and creativity and culture, we really are talking about all of it and not just the paintings that hang on the wall or you know what I mean? So yes. what you're bringing forth is is just really important in this conversation. I thank you. Corky, I'm going to turn to you and, and you give me the signal if you, if and when you want me to share my screen so we can see some of your work. But what are your thoughts about in terms of your role as an artist or your work as an artist, how you're in the role of, in Judy's words, elder and, and con contributing to your community? Well, I think uh, uh, for me, uh, there's a responsibility, you know, that goes along with uh, creating something. And the responsibility is, uh, you know, to whoever happens to see your work, you know, and what what are you trying to do with your artwork, you know, and, and for me, uh, you know, I was uh, in Los Angeles, uh, working on my graduate degree back in 1970. And, and I wound up staying there for 14 years, you know, uh, working as a contemporary artist. Uh, and it, you know, I was, I was focusing on, on a lot of environmental types of things when I was uh, doing the, my work. And then I came back home in uh, 84, and I wanted to reemerge myself, you know, within the tribal community, and that uh, it's very important. And one thing that uh, uh, that I wanted to do uh, was to uh, learn more about the tribal community and then the actually from the uh, beginning to the signing of the Hellgate Treaty of eighteen fifty five, and. I realized I hadn't really looked at that document or or, or read it, and uh, and I decided to, after doing so that it was an extremely important uh, document, and we should all have read that. You know, not only tribal members but non-tribal members, especially living on our reservation. Uh, in our community, we only make up about thirty percent of the of the population. You know, uh, as tribal people. So, as a kind of a conceptual artist, I decided that uh, I needed to make that document. This is a uh, Hellgate Treaty of 1855, and I shrunk it down, and I can fold it up the size of a credit card, and I can carry this with me wherever I go. And uh, so it's kind of like our gold card. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, extremely important. Um, and as look, thinking about our tribal communities, uh, and there's no, I don't think there's any name for art, you know, or any word for art, you know, but we'd always do things to our uh, tools and different things, you know, to uh, uh, enhance them. And, and uh, we'd carve on the, on the bone to not only, uh, honor our families, but also it was a way of uh, recognizing the contribution that animal has made, you know, it had to give its life so you can use that tool. Uh, and I was in my office one day uh, at the Sage Kootenai College and I heard this uh, tapping sound, you know, just tap, 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 a whole bunch of tapping, you know. Looked out my window and there's a row of students Kind of lined up along the sidewalk and Tim Ryan the instructor had told the students to go select two rocks 
you know, it's kind of river rocks, right? So all the students went and got their river rocks and they were tapping, you know, and so I went out to see what was going on and they said, well, well we're making tools, you know, and, and it was a tool making uh, culture class. So of course I had to go grab a couple of rocks and I began also chipping on the rock, you know, making a, a hammer or a tool. And uh, while I was doing that, what happened was it transported me back to the time of my ancestors where they had to do that, you know. And I felt like I was uh, being a part of that time, that period of time. So I could, I better understood what it was like to live then just by the simple task of tapping that rock with another rock, creating a tool that told me a lot about the energy it took and how that community functioned during that time. So you can't read about that in a book and you can't experience that in reading it on a page, but you can experience that by actually doing the activity. And that's where the teaching of our different uh, 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 things, you know, is so important it, because it, it takes you right back to, the, to that time and the lessons that, that that uh, come after that, you know, and, and the respect you have then for your resources, your environment, your animals, your plants, the, the waters, you know, all these things start coming into play and you understand what it, what it is to be a, a human being, but a, in particular, a tribal member of our tribe and community. So it's, it's extremely important then. And you talk about uh, teaching uh, or different things like your basket making or or uh, or other traditional art forms. When you gather together, um, you're not only creating or trying to recreate something like that, but but the communication goes on. You know, you know, my my wife was teaching. Uh, well, star quilt making and bead beading and TP construction and a lot of different cultural classes. And, and then one of the important elements of those classes was to talk. So as they were working on their beadwork or whatever, they were talking about things. They're talking about the beadwork. They're talking about the, the where the designs came from and different different things. So so it's a it's a real learning process and a, an enrichment of who we are as, as tribal people. Mm. Um, I don't know if you wanted to switch to the monument. I could describe mm. that just a little bit. Would love to. Can everyone see? Yes. Great. Great. Yeah, what, what you're looking at is uh, Wall of Remembrance or Eagle Circle Warrior Monument it sits outside of our tribal headquarters, and and the 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 walls are over ten feet high, and they're under uh, the traditional uh, I suppose teepee poles that represent our lodges or our homes, and the uh, eagle image that you see there um, wraps the eagle wings around the uh, are warriors that come home. And on the monument, you'll see, uh, where's the eagle being or spirit? Uh, you'll see the white buffalo or buffalo there. And the buffalo is, you'll see the uh, names that of our warriors that served going across those. Uh, and the backside, uh, you, you'll see uh, images of of our landscape, your know, important places on our on our reservation, and it's hard, a little bit hard to see the image uh, of uh, in, on the back that has the coyote and the pups and the big circle, and that represents the uh, stories of mm -hmm. uh, that were handed down to us, the coyote stories that tells us coyote tells us how we should be as human beings. Um, 
so when you visit the monument, um, it's a place to remember our warriors and those that uh, served in the armed forces, uh, but also to remember uh, why we fought, why we went to war. We went to war to preserve our community, our lands, and who we are as a people. And you'll see no, no weapons, no rockets, no missiles, no tanks, uh, no battleships. You won't see those images on this monument because we're not trying to glorify uh, the war. We're trying to welcome home our veterans and let them know that we're thankful for their for their service and and how they uh, uh, helped our community. That as we and that was one thing that we didn't really have prior to this was uh, something that would welcome home our veterans. So this was a way uh, to try to do that. And on either side of the eagle image that you see there are a woman on a horse and a uh, warrior on a horse. And the woman is carrying a eagle fan with the baby uh, on the side and a cradle board representing her important role in our community. And the, the chief or the warrior on the other side is carrying our, showing our, our flag, which is a, a staff. And there's no, no guns, you know, there. But they're welcoming home our, our veterans and thanking them for their service. I'm so glad, um, Corky, that we made a moment to have have a look. Um, I'm going to stop my share here, just in the interest of time, because we're coming up on our hour, and. Um, we had a last question here, and which is that in the spirit of exchange, you all have been so generous in sharing from your perspectives. And I wonder if there's something that our audience members or me, NASA, what could we offer in return that would make this conversation equally meaningful for you all as it has been for us? I just think more opportunity like this was very helpful because I know that um, visitors that we get here at the museum, natives and non-natives alike uh, have questions and want, you know, I think our youth craving more information, non-natives and natives alike um, have more of these opportunities. I don't know how much uh, or how many times you have continue and add, but maybe we could do a continue and add and each continue and add, you have a small uh, a small piece of a native, native uh, continue and add. And I think, you know, I'm sure we have other colleagues that can really share information um, regarding health, you know, botany, plants, and, you know, things like that. I think it'd be, be nice to have uh, something like that every time we have a talking circle or something to include a small native portion to that. And I know because in my area, uh, as far as our dictionaries are uh, concerned, it's we're doing another second edition because our first dictionary did not include our ceremonial walk, our ceremonial uh, people, because I'm coming from the ceremonial walk. The book really revolved around the Christian people, you know, because where we're at, you have the, the Christian walk and the ceremonial walk. I belong on a ceremonial walk. It's still very active in my uh, community and ceremonial world, but that didn't reflect in our dictionary. So we have this ongoing continuing education. So that's what we need. I think more opportunities like this was very, very great. I love this. I'd love the opportunity to provide opportunities for our youth 
to teach. I think it's a great way to um, complete the learning circle for them to be able to to get out there and share um, is a whole nother set of lessons to learn for them. And um, I would like more opportunities to have them get out there. Yeah, I think uh, any way that we can create uh, opportunities to to gather, you know, as tribal people is just so uh, important. You know, unfortunately, our most common way that we gather lately is in our wakes. You know, we we've lost so many people. You know, and uh, it's a hard hard time. But at the same time. You know, people do talk and they do uh, discuss different things, you know, and, and health, of course, is a huge, huge issue. And um, so it's a sad time, but it's also a, a very important time. And uh, it, it, it helps our community heal, too. Um, sure. and we do have our ceremonies at different times of the year. The jump dances are coming up. Uh, soon, well, beginning of the year, and that's our gathering point where we jump, we dance, and uh, for the upcoming year to thank, thank the Creator for the year that we just uh, lived through. Um, but the powwows and different gatherings like this is so important because you see our our outfits and and uh, and our regalia that we dance in. You know, it talks a lot about who we are today. But it also is reflective of, of our of our ancestors and our old ones that, that have contributed so much. Um, so, yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, today. You know, I think it, hopefully uh, we can gather again. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, you know, you may have a closing a voice. Uh, this little. What I what I'm wearing is a pin, double headed arrow pin, and you know when you talk about arrows. You know, you, you, a lot of us think of our tribal people. You know, using bow and arrows. Well, this this is a uh, double headed arrow that you see when you come to a T intersection. You know, it tells you you got to slow up, stop, and make a decision which way you're going to go. And uh, you know, I use this. Uh, to point out that we we're out of making bad choices, especially with our environment and, and who we are as a people. We have to be making the right choices now. We're we, we're running out of options. We are right at the appointed hour when we said we would end our session. Um, that was a really great way to bring us to a close. And I'm sorry that we didn't have a chance for audience questions, but that is on me. I wanted to make sure we got um, through our, our proposed questions with our guests. Maybe if folks have questions that you would like to um, email to me, and I can share with Judy and Teresa and Corky via email after the fact, um, that would be a way to accomplish that. I, I know and hope and trust that we'll all stay in touch. Um, and I just want to express really, truly my gratitude for your presence and your wisdom and your um, just coming together for this moment. So Judy, thank you. Corky, thank you. Teresa, thank you very much. And have a wonderful night. We're going to start our second intermission now. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Hey, Jack, a face. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I'm lunch. I'm lunch.